I'm, uh, I'm Colin Dark. Um, the title of the show is uh, Grotesque Mediocrity, um, which is a quote from the um, introduction of a piece of text that I'm using in the show by Karl Marx. It's called The 18th Brumaire of Louis Bonaparte, and it is actually about the coup d'etat of Louis Bonaparte just before he became Napoleon III. Um, the book was written by Marx between the coup and the proclamation of the empire, anticipating it. And uh, Marx didn't really think much of him. He kind of refers to him um, as a buffoon, as a fool. And in fact, as I said, this is where the title of the show comes from, is from the introduction to the second edition of that, where Marx says that um, what he was doing was trying to show how, at that time, um, in the mid-19th century, um, French class struggle allowed a grotesque mediocrity to play the part of, uh, of a hero. Now, I've been using Marxist texts for a number of years now um, in various forms. Um, and I've also, in recent years, developed an interest in the work of Bertolt Brecht, particularly as the theories of um, epic theatre. And, uh, and attempting to kind of try and, try and apply those to visual art. This piece came specifically from that, thinking maybe of using the space like a theatrical space, like a theatre stage in a way, and with all the objects that are used in the installation. The objects in the, in the piece uh, come from a play called Ubu Wa, King Ubu, by Afrid Jari, which was first performed in 1896. And um, it's a really absurdist play, it's kind of pre uh, surrealist, pre-Dada, but it was a big influence on both of those movements. In fact, Duchamp uh, regarded him as one of his biggest influences. I'm not really making exact parallels, because obviously there aren't exact parallels between the two, but the, the fictional Ubu and the real Napoleon III, um, that's, I'm kind of juxtaposing those two figures. The play was written about 25 years after the end of the empire, and so it's kind of putting the two things together to make some kind of comparison, historical comparison between fiction and reality. Well, Ubu was he's kind of like a child, really, in the way he responds to objects. He has this sort of, he fetishizes objects, gets very excited about them in the way a child does about toys. So this sort of fetishizing of objects in there, I thought, I think, was interesting to me because it kind of relates to what Marx said about the fetishization of commodities. And uh, it seems to sort of have a parallel there. The form of the work is a spiral shape. And um, the actual, actually, the spiral comes from Ubu himself as well, because Jerry uh, portrayed Ubu uh, as having a spiral on his fat belly. And um, it's, been said, it's been said, I found recently, that, um, that this is kind of an equivalent with, for Ubu of um, Christ's sacred heart sitting on his chest, and the spiral represents his intestines. So as you walk around the spiral, um, you can actually follow the narrative of the play. For example, the dinner set, before he has the king killed, um, he invites a number of possible allies to a large kind of a banquet at his place and then kills off the ones who clearly aren't of any use to him. The green candle is actually it's, um, it's an exclamation of his. He, um, he just says, buy my green candle quite a lot. It's kind of like a, you know, suffering Socrates or something, you know, it's this, this sort of bizarre sort of um, uh, surreal, dada kind of exclamation of his. The kazoos, for example, is a gift that he gives to the king when they're carrying out the plan to assassinate the king. He, uh, his, his plan is to hand him a kazoo as a gift and then stamp on his foot as a signal for his general to come in and kill him. So therefore we have the kazoos and the boots. So the bear is important because he's attacked after he's defeated, he goes and hides in a cave and he's attacked by a bear and one of his minions kills the bear with um, an exploding knuckle duster. <laughs> The colanders are actually from another piece by Ubu. Um, they're a boat. This boat was made out of a sieve, and the sieve had wax in it to make it waterproof. And then they, the, they, they carried out their journey on this, this boat, but it was all on land. It didn't even go in the sea. So, um, so you can't write in a sieve, so I use colanders instead. <laughs> the, the piece is a development of um, 
are things that have been, going, that I've been doing for the last couple of years um, uh, where they're floor based. But the one thing, I mean, my work has changed quite a lot over the years, but one thing that's been almost a constant throughout, say, the last 20 years has been my use of text. The movement to the floor came when I was in, I did the, uh, uh, the residency at the Buddhist school at Rome, and while I was there, I, um, the work became sculptural. I'd been looking at apples before. Now, apples were kind of quite important to me because um, I was really interested, I'd been getting increasingly interested in the paintings of Gustave Courbet. And when he was in 1871 with the Paris Commune, he became a member of the Commune and he was kind of responsible for, for the arts. Courbet was imprisoned. But when he was in prison, he, was, he painted apples. He did still life paintings of apples, which as far as I'm aware, he hadn't done before. And it's been said that the apples um, were... If you look at the, the paintings, in most of them, the apples are starting to turn, they're starting to rot. And so it's been said that these represented the dead bodies they'd seen, and because of course the last time he'd seen Paris it was littered with dead bodies piled up all over the streets. And so I appropriated the apple as a symbol for, um, I don't know, generally I suppose for class struggle or for oppression um, uh, and the putting down of uh, working class aspirations. You know.